Welcome to Tattooed Freaks in Business Suits, recorded live in the kitchen of the Personal Touch Career Services in Denver, Colorado. I am your host, Donna Shannon. As a professional career coach, I help people navigate the hiring maze to get the job they really love. In addition to working with job seekers one-on-one, I do have a book out there. It's called How to Get a Job Without Going Crazy, and you can find it on Amazon. Today, my guest is Danielle Mindich, a fellow career coach uh, that I've actually collaborated with several years now, and uh, she has a little bit different take on things rather than what I do, so we're going to be diving into it today to discuss, uh, is it really possible to have a job you love, as well as how do you know if your job is not the right fit for you? So overall, our show's purpose is to explore and redefine the world of work, especially as Gen X, Millennials, and those who come after seek positions of leadership that still allow them to be themselves. Every show, we will explore a topic related to business or job searching, and of course, we're going to talk about tattoos. Our sponsor is the Personal Touch Career Services, Denver's top-rated career coaching service. We focus on the practical tools for your job search, including resumes, LinkedIn profiles, job search coaching, and ongoing classes. Check out our ridiculously long website, personaltouchcareerservices.com. Once again, that's personaltouchcareerservices.com, or, you know, you can just Google it. So good morning, Danielle. How are you today? I'm doing well, Donna. How are you doing? Perfect, perfect. So I got to know Danielle through the Colorado Career Development Association, and we've been uh, collaborating for years now. So Mm -hmm. Danielle, why don't you just tell us a little bit more about yourself? Wonderful. Thank you, Donna. Well, Donna, you take care more of the strategic end of career coaching, cover letters, resumes, LinkedIn. I don't do any of that type of stuff. I am a coach that really helps my clients identify their career direction. So my clients tend to be mid-career professionals, meaning they have titles like project manager, scrum master, um, and they typically cannot walk away from their income or salary but want to find something more meaningful or fulfilling. So I work with them to help them understand what deeply motivates them and then figure out what would be the next natural pivot. I do work with a lot of young professionals as well, and I do have my boomer clients too, but my my main focus is typically that mid-career, so a lot of my clients tend to be Gen Xers. Gotcha. So do you think it's possible to really find a job that you love? Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you don't love it, at least like it more than what you currently have. Mm -hmm. One thing I always share with my potential clients is that I always find my clients will eventually make a career move towards something that's a much better fit. So it may not be they fully love it, but it ends up being significantly better. So the answer is yes, but I think more importantly, I think no matter what, there is something always better out there for you if you're unhappy in your current situation. Right, right. So why do you think people are staying with these jobs that they don't uh, like? And I mean like staying with them like a long time, like 10 and 20 years. Well, Donna, when I do career coaching, a lot of it is from a deeper place. My background's in clinical social work. And when I created my method to work with clients, I really looked at psychology to guide my career coaching practice. And that takes me to a reason why it's really hard to leave a job you don't like, and that's because it's scary to make changes. Mm -hmm. Um, We get stuck in patterns of behavior, and those patterns can hold us back. And I think a lot of times people stay in jobs they dislike because it really is scary to make a change. Right. It's a case of the devil you do know is better than the one you don't. Exactly. Exactly. And we get used to the familiar. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the telltale signs that you are in the wrong job? Yeah. Well, you know, 
I think there's quite a few. The first one, um, I, I do want to just say that I did have, um, I contributed towards an article. So I'm looking back at some notes from this article mm -hmm. that I contributed towards, and it was called Signs You Need to Quit Your Job. It was written for the list by Daniela Uslin. And the notes that I originally wrote were, you know, I typically find people want to leave for a while. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at least six months, that's typically a, a sign that it's time to go. If you've been contemplating your change for over six months, you know, there's there may be something else going on. Um, some other signs, you can't get along with your boss. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, it's really hard to work for somebody you're not getting along with. And, um, of course, I always encourage clients to look at strategies to better get along with their bosses or colleagues, but sometimes you can try everything and it's just not a good fit. Right. So I think that's a big one. Um, or that leads to another area, which is the culture isn't a good fit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think sometimes people work for um, organizations or businesses where their values may not be in alignment with the culture of the company. Um, I can give you a really concrete example. I worked with a client in sales and he was very much about quality relationships, but the sales position he was in was all about the transaction. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, quality connection were his um, core values, but it wasn't really the value of the company and that wasn't their end game. So that was a true value disconnect and that really led to being a cultural misfit. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another sign, yeah, the ener your energy is drained by the end of the day. Mm. If you do not enjoy what you do and you're finding that the roles and responsibilities drain you, that's another sign that you should probably leave your position. Or um, I think that also then lends into, you know, not just the roles and responsibilities, but day to day. If you go through and detail out what you're doing, do you not, do you like it? Do you dislike it? Is it tolerable? And you realize that a majority of your day is spending time doing things you do not love to do in terms of roles and responsibilities. That's a really telling sign. It's yeah. Believe. yeah, I actually have an exercise that I developed um, that I take my clients through. I call it the four L's. Mm -hmm. So we look at what are you doing in your job on a daily basis, and do you love it, like it, live with it or loathe it. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept is to start moving into jobs where the typical responsibilities fall into the either love it or like it categories and a yeah. little bit less of what you hate. And uh, we know we're grown-ups, you know, you're not going to love absolutely every 100% everything that you're doing in your job. Mm -hmm. so that's my own business owner. There's some things that I don't like to do, but when things tip the balance that you're doing more of what you love and less of what you hate, that's where the true job satisfaction starts to come in. I'm with you all the way. And it's funny, I do a very similar exercise with my clients, Donna. And what I have typically found is that clients will not be coming to me or perhaps even you if I say they're about 60% satisfaction in their role. Yeah. It's when they start kind of dipping to that 50, 40 percent and finding that a majority of their day is spent in that dislikes category. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have um, one gentleman that I worked with real briefly. He was a relatively new college graduate and uh, he wasn't finding luck. So mm -hmm. his dad paid for a session with me, <laughs> which is always interesting. Mm -hmm. but his deal was he wanted to work in professional sports. Mm. Either like as the physical therapist or uh, even into the marketing side of things, you know, kind of back office or supporting the athletes. And so I knew there was a, an internship program. It's kind of, it's not exactly an internship program, but it acts like one. You're still getting paid for it through Cronky Sports here in town, which owns the Colorado Avalanche, the Denver Nuggets, and the Mammoth. And it was an inside sales role. So it's on the phones, heavy for three months. If you perform well enough at that, 
then they bring you up to the next level and you start to actually, you know, calling on clients and things like this to sell season tickets and stuff. So he's like, oh yeah, that could be my foot in the door and I could do that for a while and then move to a different department. And then I made him do that four L's exercise. Mm-hmm. And the absolute thing he loathed the most was cold calls, uh, talking on the phone and sales and lead generation and all like, this is not going to work <laughs> because even if he managed to get into the position and even if he pushed through all the things that he hated and still managed to do well, the problem with that is burning the bridge. Because say he stepped in there, did okay, but then took on the sales role and performed really poorly. Mm-hmm. Now he soured the entire relationship with the organization And there is no other option to move to a different department. Well, and I think you you bring up a very important point. When I work with my younger clients especially, I say you have to like the trajectory of the career. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So even that entry-level position to that midpoint to that late point, there has to be aspects that you like throughout that career. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to get to that next level. Mm -hmm. And the way that a lot of our companies are structured is it's very bureaucratic, um, where you start off kind of doing more of that implementer role and eventually move up to something either more strategic or visionary, but you have to really nail that implementer role first. Right. And so I think a lot of times um, if you can't even make through that entry level position or that first position to get you to that next level, it doesn't even even matter. Right. Now, to kind of piggyback on that, there are some of the entry level positions that you can pivot into another direction. Mm -hmm. I I know when I did radio, I literally started in the mail room and then Mm -hmm. I was in the business office and then I did the weird... 90% 90% turn to become the a morning show producer at one of the major radio stations here in town. But that was my crazy plan all along. Mm-hmm. So I was doing things to build the technical skills and the relationships necessary to make that move. Sure. A, a really weird, crazy turn like that takes some planning to it. Sure. And some dedication. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to be able to get through the things you don't like in exactly. order to yeah, so, um, I mean, when you were in the mailroom, for example, how much did you actually like that part of the position? I actually did. I did enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. And I think that's the thing is it doesn't mean you can't pay your dues, but you have to enjoy the way you're paying your dues to some degree um, or be idea. able to t- tolerate it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So what kind of tools do you use to help people figure out their career path? Yeah, so um, when I work with clients, a big part of what I do is a storytelling exercise I created. So um, Donna, what happened to me years ago was I was in a yoga class with this guy named Robert Wood. And he is, he's an intuitive and being in Denver, I know a lot of woo-woo is out there. and mm-hmm. What happened was um, Robert was sharing with us that the way we find our purpose is through finding out the things that have held us back or the problems we've struggled with the most. And I did this class with him. It was unbelievable. And I realized through this class what an incredible connector I am. So I took that experience and I created a storytelling exercise where I take my clients back to their childhood and we look at two key memories that form their identity today, both positive and negative. Mm. And the reason I do that is because the positive memory of when we were kids is always indicative of how we want to feel. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Um, so if you were a little kid that always wanted to feel connection, just like me, if you always wanted to feel unconditional love, you're going to be happiest in your career when you have moments of that. Gotcha. Um, on the flip side, when we look at our memories of what pulled us back, for me, that's when I was bullied. I had moments of disconnection. 
And what I learned deeply motivates me to my core is this idea of wanting to have depth and connection with people. Right. So when we look at that relationship, what holds me back and having that bullying incident happen to me and those moments of disconnect um, really helped me form my motivation or my big why. And mm -hmm. that's um, I, I deeply desire to connect with people because um, of what happened to me. And so my point of sharing this with you is that I think when I look at tools that I use with clients, I always want to figure out their deeper why. Not only what are you passionate about, but why are you? Mm -hmm. Because when you look at your story of your childhood, um, what, what motivates you, what holds you back always has a relationship with one another. And on the flip side is um, your deep why you do what you want to do. And I think that's the most important. That makes sense. That makes yeah. Sense. So I, I love to figure that out, but more for people who are just looking for other tools. Um, I love using um, this website called collegeincolorado.com. Okay. Have you ever seen that one before? No, I haven't. What's that one about? Um, it's really incredible. It has um, a series of tests you can take. And what it does is it provides you um, career results like the ONAT does. Mm -hmm. But what's really great about it is if you live in Colorado or you can change the setting to your own state, it goes in more depth as to what associations you can join. Oh, cool. For each oh. career that you research, what are the earnings, um, both by county and by region? It tells mm -hmm. you the um, projected job outlook. It gives you roles and responsibilities like a job would look like. So I think that's one of my favorite tools in addition to the ONAT. So there's some really great assessments on college in Colorado that I suggest my clients to take as well. Okay, so for our listeners, that website again is collegeincolorado.org. Dot dot yeah. And ONET, for anybody who's listening that doesn't know what that is, so it's onetonline.org, so it's the letter O, N-E-T, like you're catching things in a net, online.org. That is actually a website uh, that is managed by the federal government. Yes, they did get something right. Shock. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's a repository of all the job descriptions in the United States for all of our uh, positions. So it's been going for several years. They keep building on the database. And it has a sister site to it that's a little bit easier to use, known as uh, mynextmove.org. And you can explore the careers themselves, either by industry, title, or keywords. And my next move has a small personality test to see uh, some of the suggestions for maybe what might be a good fit for you. Um, now, I say that one is actually fairly accurate, but you have to take the results in a creative spin. So, for example, when I did that test, it told me I should be a teacher. I'm not going to stand in front of a classroom and teach kids, but one of the things I really love to do is teach job seekers about finding a job. So then it's like, oh yeah, that that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's. Um, I would say college in Colorado is very similar, and it provides similar assessments. I use the ONET as well. Um, it's just another tool. So mm -hmm. very cool. Very cool. Um, so so I also think there are some of the other things that are holding people back from pursuing their passions, like some of the real self-limiting statements, for example. Sure. Um, I think some of the ones is I don't have the skill set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a lot of times if you actually dig a lot deeper into what you've done in your previous roles, there's always a way to translate what you've done in your previous roles to um, – the position in which you're interested or applying for, there's a reason you're attracted to it. So um, I think that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. And, and along with the skills thing too, it's real important to know, and this is my HR background shining through, mm -hmm. is that there's always things on the job description that I care about more than others. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell from reading the job description which ones are the ones they care about the very much, most, unless they say required instead of preferred. 
Sure. And there have been studies out recently that women will apply to a job if they have 80% of the qualifications. Mm -hmm. Whereas men will apply to a job if they have 60% of the qualifications. I even heard 40. 40, yes. <laughs> it kind of depends on the study that you're looking at. Exactly. Yeah, and that's nothing wrong with women. I think we want to make sure that we're not wasting anybody's time, that we're well qualified and all the rest of that. But it's like if you want to catch more interviews, it's okay to step out of that box and take a risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I think, truth be told, I think a lot of the power of getting hired is the belief that you can do it. Yes. The ability to express it. And so I always share with my female clients, like, in this circumstance, pretend you're a man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate putting it that way, but man, it's like amazing what that shift actually does and changes within my clients when I share that. It's kind of sad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then, of course, one of the, the hesitations that I hear all the time, and it's sad because it's our Gen Xers are now saying this, that I'm too old. Because, mm. you know, like me, they're getting into their 40s or deep in 40s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it, you know, we still have 20 years to go in our careers. But there's that fear and that belief of, oh, they only want to hire millennials. Nobody's going to give me what I'm worth and, and all the rest of that. Do you find uh, that you run into that problem as well? The answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I do think there is a reality of age bias. Um, I do think that there is a reality that there is a, you know, there is, there are companies who believe that um, they can hire someone younger to do the position, but that's not every company. And there are a lot of companies out there that do believe that um, there is a lot of knowledge and there is a lot of skill that is brought with experience. Yes. Yeah. And so I kind of, I always compare it to dating Donna. It just takes one. And so you may have to kiss a couple of frogs to get your prints. It's the same thing with finding the right employer. And I think there are, and I always tell my clients to informational interview and network with their friends because if they're friends who are also um, in their age demographic are working for a company that believes in them, it's more likely that company is going to have the culture and believe that experience brings a lot of value to the table. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. All right, so uh, we're up to my favorite part of this show where we get to talk about tattoos, but Danielle, mm -hmm. you don't have a tattoo. I don't have a tattoo. But, but you... I'm all about uh, body modification and all its various forms, and you have had some interesting piercings, right? I did have a tongue piercing, and it was in college. I was 19 years old, and two of my friends said, let's go get our tongues pierced, and they both get their tongues pierced. I'm the last one to have it happen, and the guy says to me, I'm out of 14 gauges, and 14 okay. gauges are a thin needle that will pierce your tongue. And it's the average side that, that most people start off with the tongue piercing. So I said, well, what do you have? And I had no idea what a gauge was or anything about piercings. He thought I was personally asking him about his tongue piercing. Oh, boy. And he said, well, I have an eight gauge. And I said, okay, I'll get an eight gauge. And oh. so I had my tongue pierced with a needle the size of my pinky. Oh my and god. A tongue ring that was like the size of my pinky. It was so crazy. It only lasted for six months because it kept on um, hurting the enamel of my teeth. Uh, but that was my tongue piercing story. Wow. But hats off to you. You did that like a boss. <laughs> Well, hey, that, that always talks about the importance of communication and clarifying <laughs> questions. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was quite an experience. Well, cool. Well, Danielle, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, so Danielle's company is Inner Compass Coaching. And how can people reach you? It's Inner Compass Coach. I, -N -N I was close. You were great. 
I N N E R C O M P A S S Coach C O A C H dot com. And if you go to my website and you're looking to pivot your career, please reach out to me for a complimentary consultation. Great. And then the way you work with people, uh, you work with people across the country, right? Correct. And yeah. you do like individual counseling as well as some groups. Just just tell me a little bit more about your services. Sure, sure. So I work with the four session process to help my clients identify their direction. And I either do that through group or individual coaching. My small groups run every quarter. So my next one is coming up in September. That's and September 2018. Correct, correct. And, um, you know, my, my groups are small. I value connections, so I typically only have about four to five people in my small groups. And when I work individually, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. And um, my goal is to help you, re you know, reconnect with your why, your confidence, and help you establish your direction. Great. Well, Danielle, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Donna. My, my name is Donna Shannon with the Personal Touch Career Services. So. Please feel free to reach out to us as well if you need help with those practical tools for your job search. A lot of times uh, the way Danielle and I collaborate is if I have somebody who doesn't know what they want to be when they grow up or that next career path, I often refer them to Danielle. And then uh, if they still need help with their resume, LinkedIn profiles, interview coaching, then they'll come back to me and we'll put in that strategic plans for helping them get that job now that they've identified it. All right, so I'll have our contact information in the comment boxes. So thank you very much, everybody, and until next time. Thank you, Donna. Thanks.